director of Blue Rock Finance. Um, so basically for you, for those of you that are unaware, um, Blue Rock itself is a multi-facet professional services firm um, that offers our clients a complete end-to-end -end solution for their self-managed super fund needs, uh, which includes accounting and audit, property finance, insurance, both life cover um, and general insurance for property held in the fund, financial planning and investment advice, legal services such as self-managed super fund setups and property conveyancing and preparation of leases. Today on our webinar, we have a, a great panel of subject matter experts, um, which I'll just introduce to you now. Um, heading up our panel today will be George Caravez, who is the uh, head of our self-managed super fund division here at Blue Rock, uh, followed by uh, Alex Theodoro, who is one of our senior relationship managers um, in our Blue Rock Finance Division. Um, and then followed on by Lauren, uh, Lauren Smythe, who is uh, one of our lawyers, or a part of our Blue Rock legal team, um, who is the subject matter, um, all things property from a legal perspective. Um, and then we'll be followed on by our Director of Private Wealth, Lee Fernando. Um, so welcome to this, today's seminar. Um, we hope you get a lot out of it. Uh, I'm sure you will. Um, just in relation to um, the Q&A or questions, um, there is a Q&A box at the bottom of the seminar, um, at the bottom of your screen there. So feel free at any time uh, to jump in there and ask any questions that you may have in relation to, to self-managed super fund and property. Um, and also we will have time at the end um, of the session today to go through some Q&A as well. Um, so just on your screen now, there is our disclaimer. Um, so it is very important that we obviously, we, we pop this up because this is a, uh, an information session only. Um, it isn't a sales webinar at, at, by any stretch of the imagination. This is purely just set up um, for you to ascertain information on, on investing in property through a self-managed super fund. Um, so have a read of the, the disclaimer there. I won't go fully through it, but um, you can understand obviously that, uh, that, that this is obviously just an information session for your purposes. So please, hopefully you get, um, you, you get some great advice out of today's session. All right, so without any further ado, we might jump into the content. Um, as I said, we're, we're starting off um, with the head of our um, self-managed super fund division, George Caravers today. So um, over to you, George. Thank you, Jamie. And again, welcome to our viewers. Uh, in the next 10 minutes, I'll present you a number of options for buying property through an SMSF. Uh, please note, in the essence of time, I don't have time to go into the detail of these scenarios, uh, so that they're a high level, and if anyone's got questions at the end, we're more than happy to answer them. So options for buying property via an SMSF, we've got direct ownership options as well as indirect ownership options. With direct, you've got the direct acquisition, so paying the property in cash. In specie transfer to an SMSF, which is contributing the property into a self-managed super fund, and then tenants in common, and that could be with a related party as well as an unrelated party. With indirect ownership options, we've got the unlisted unit trust, and that could be related or unrelated. And the last one we'll talk about will be borrowing uh, via limited recourse borrowing arrangement to uh, purchase property. Just before I go into those scenarios, though, there are two rules that I wanted to bring up. Um, and that's around the acquisition of property as well as leasing of the properties. So with commercial property, an SMSF can purchase a property from either an unrelated third party or it could purchase a property from a related party of the fund. The only difference is that if it's, it is a related party of the fund, it needs to satisfy the business rule property conditions. And what that means is, is that that property um, is generally is really considered to be holding exclusively in the use of a business. So as an example, we have a cabinet maker who owns a warehouse that he leases to his business. This is considered business real property and therefore his SMSF can acquire the property from him at, uh, at market value. On the other hand, with residential property, um, you cannot purchase a residential property from a related party of the fund. And therefore any, related, uh, any residential property acquisitions must be made from an unrelated seller. The ATO briefly describes related parties to include members of the fund, their relatives and their associates. So this rule is really there um, so that no one associated with an SMSF um, can get a present day benefit from its investments. So when we've got clients asking us about purchasing residential property, we always tell them, who are you buying from and is it a related party? Then moving on to the leasing uh, rule, uh, commercial property can be leased to both related and unrelated parties of the SMSF. If the leasing party is related, it is important to know that the terms of the lease must be commercial and at arm's length to avoid breaching any of the superannuation rules. 
So back to the example of the cabinet maker, his SMSF purchased the property from him and the SMSF will now lease the property back to his business. The lease terms must be commercial at arm's length. And what that means is that he cannot lease the property to his business at an amount below or above market rates. When it comes to residential property, it's a little bit different because you cannot lease a residential property that you own in your SMSF to a related party of the fund. And no one um, from those people can actually stay at the property at any time. So for example, if your SMSF invests in a beach house that is leased out via property agent or Airbnb, no related party could stay there, even if they paid market rates for the stay. Moving on to our first scenario, and that's direct property acquisition. If your SMSF has the cash available, um, it can purchase the property outright. And this is the simplest form of ownership. Um, with an outright purchase, the SMSF has direct control of the asset and the property will have the SMSF trustee or trustees on title. One important aspect of this is that the property can um, not, the property must remain unencumbered, which means you cannot borrow uh, money out of the equity of the property. And in our diagram here, we've got the SMSF, which pays cash for the property, whether that's commercial or residential. The property is then leased to a tenant and the tenant pays rent to the SMSF. And again, if the tenant, um, if this is a uh, commercial property, it can be a related party tenant. Moving on to the second scenario, and that is property acquisition via an in-specie transfer. If you currently own business real property, um, and that's commercial property, you could transfer the property to your SMSF by using the superannuation contribution caps. That transfer will need to be made at market value. Um, and as mentioned before, you cannot transfer residential property that you own into your SMSF. There are some important things to note here. So careful planning is needed for this option to ensure you don't breach the superannuation caps, which may limit the value of a property that could be transferred into an SMSF. There are also uh, stamp duty exemptions. So for example, in Victoria, there is no stamp duty to transfer property from an SMSF where the property was contributed to the fund and no money is exchanged. You've also got to consider any capital gains that could arise from the transfer. So the cost of the cost that you've purchased the property in your own name versus the market value when you transfer it into the SMSF. This is a scenario that we highly recommend that um, the people wanting to do this speak to their financial advisor and accountant. To our diagram, I've got an example here. Um, we've got John and Jane. They're going to utilize their non-concessional contribution caps with the three-year bring forward to in-specie transfer a commercial property that they personally own into an SMSF valued at 530,000. So the property is transferred into the SMSF. The property then is leased to a tenant and the same thing again, the rent is paid to the SMSF. Moving on to our third um, scenario and that is tenants in common. Um, you can in fact purchase a property as tenants in common with your SMSF. Um, and I'll go through an example in our diagram. Yeah, we've got the SMSF and an investor that investor can be related or unrelated. Um, in the example, it's 50% each, but it could vary depending on what the agreement is. They pay 50% of the cost of the, of the property and then they lease the property to a tenant. The, Important thing here to note is that when that tenant pays the rent, it has to pay the rent in proportion to the ownership back to the SMSF and to the other investor. And the same goes for your expenses. So any expenses that are due for the property, um, the SMSF will pay its portion and the other investor will pay their portion as well. Moving on to the indirect uh, property acquisitions now, uh, it's by a related non-geared unit trust. So with this scenario, the SMSF invests cash into a unit trust in return for a percentage return. The members of the SMSF, um, all the related parties also invest in the unit trust. This makes it a related unit trust. It's important to note that in this scenario, the unit trust cannot borrow to fund the purchase of the property as the superannuation rules specifically state there cannot be any borrowing with a related party unit trust investment. I'll go on to our example. And so here we've got the unit trust, it's ungeared, so there's no borrowing in it. And we've got the SMSF and the related party. So in this scenario, John and Jane are members of the SMSF. Andrew, who says John's brother, they each invest $400,000 into the unit trust. So there's $800,000 in the unit trust. The unit trust then goes and buys the property. And that property is then leased out to a tenant. The tenant pays the rent back to the unit trust and all the expenses are paid by the unit trust. The investors here are merely going to receive a distribution of profits at the end of the year. 
And then moving on to a similar structure, but in this case, it's an unrelated unit trust. Um, the SMSF and its related parties hold no more than 50% of the units in the trust, and therefore it's considered to be an unrelated investment. Once you go over the 50%, it becomes a related party investment. So that's important to note that. Um, it's also important to note that with an unrelated unit trust, the unit trust can actually borrow to buy property and the property could be used as security for the loan. Moving on to our scenario example, we've got three SMSFs, they're all unrelated. We've also got an individual unrelated investor. Um, say they all put in 25% into the unit trust, so $250,000 each. There's a million dollars in the unit trust. The unit trust approaches the bank, applies for a loan for another million dollars, and then goes buys a property worth $2 million. Similarly to the previous example, the tenant will pay the rent back to the unit trust, and then the unit trust will pay back distributions to each of the investors at the end of the year. Our last example will be acquiring property via limited, borrow, uh, limited recourse borrowing arrangement. So an SMSF can in fact borrow to purchase property um, with these types of structures. An additional trustee is set up to hold the property in trust while there's a debt in the property. And if you're going down this path, we do recommend that you speak with your financial advisor, your accountant, as well as with your mortgage broker to make sure your SMSF can actually borrow to buy the property. Um, you don't want to be putting a deposit down on something and then finding out that you can't borrow the, the money to, to acquire the property. And to our diagram here, we've got the SMSF, takes out a loan from a lender. The SMSF is responsible for making repayments to the lender. Um, the lender only has limited recourse to the property. So this is important. So if the SMSF cannot pay the loan uh, back to the lender, the lender can only come after the property. And that property is held in trust and separate to the other SMSF assets. Same again with the lease, it's leased to a tenant and that tenant will be paying the rent to the SMSF. That is the high level view of all these scenarios. Um, I'll now pass you on to Jamie for the next section. Thanks, George. Uh, very informative, mate. It's, um, it's great to get an understanding of the different structures and strategies um, available to our clients in relation to acquiring property through the self-managed super fund. Um, so thank you very much for that. Obviously, the last one there, which is uh, limited recourse borrowing arrangement, um, which involves obviously going into debt and, and acquiring the property through a self-managed super fund, um, is a good segue into the, to our next uh, presenter, Alex Theodoro. Um, who's the Senior Relationship Manager uh, in Blue Rock Finance here. So Alex, I'll pass you over, I'll pass it over to you, mate, just to run us through um, how the limited recourse borrowing arrangement works and how clients would go about dealing with the banks um, to acquire property through their self-managed super fund. Yes, thanks, Jamie, and thanks, George. Um, so yeah, I'll just briefly go through some of the key considerations um, when obtaining finance via a limited recourse borrowing arrangement. Um, so a primary consideration under this structure is the serviceability assessment. Now, lenders must ensure that the income of the SMSF can comfortably service the proposed repayments over the term of the loan. Um, now, as a part of that, the income that's included in the lender's assessment includes the rental income that's actually been generated by the property being acquired. Um, depending on the asset, that may be shaded from, say, 100% of the rent down to 80% of the rent by the lender, um, plus member contributions that are being made to the SMSF. Um, lenders will typically use an average of the last two years member contributions for that component, um, as well as income generated from other assets held by the SMSF. And that's basically from the assets that are going to remain within the fund after the acquisition of the property, which can include term deposits and shares. Um, so some other key considerations that, that need to be factored into your review when looking at this type of structure. Um, there are a limited number of lenders in this market. Um, as finance brokers, we have all access to all lenders in the SMSF space. Um, and it's important to note that there's no major banks who are actually playing in this field anymore. Um, they are expensive loans to manage and there are high compliance and audit costs for those lenders, um, which is part of the reason that the major banks exited from this space. Depending on you know, various factors, including serviceability assessment, um, the SMSFs can borrow up to 80% of a property value or the purchase price being residential or commercial property. Um, and it's also worth noting that rates are typically higher under this sort of borrowing structure. So you're not gonna see the, the normal 
owner occupied principal and interest rates that you're seeing in the market now under the SMSF structure. Um, you can obtain a loan term up to 30 years and there are interest, op interest only options available as well. Um, the lenders may request a statement of, of, statement of advice from a financial planner um, just to confirm that the requested term is appropriate for this fund. Um, there are lenders fees and charges to be considered and I'll go into that in more detail in the next, next example. Um, and also it's important to note that there are liquidity requirements for the fund to hold. So basically um, lenders don't want the property to make up 100% of the fund's assets. It's important to have some level of liquid assets also held in the fund, which would co cover any unexpected developments such as um, vacancy and a loss of rent for a period of time or any repairs that need to be made to the property. Um, and obviously if there's no liquid assets available in the fund, then that may create an issue for the SMSF. So just moving on to the next slide, um, I thought it'd be worth briefly running through an example of um, a real life example of financing a property via a LRBA. Um, so this is an example of an office purchase within an SMSF that's actually leased to a third party tenant as opposed to being owner occupied by a related party. So in this example, um, there were clients with net assets of 500,000 in their fund. They targeted an opportunity to acquire a commercial office building that had a long term lease in place and they made an offer subject to finance. So as part of the process, we completed a serviceability assessment to ensure that the income of the fund, including the proposed rent, can comfortably meet the loan repayments. So there's that formula there again, it's that the rental income plus the member contributions, plus any investment returns that are on assets are gonna be held within the fund. Um, and can that service an interest uh, uh, facility over, over the proposed loan term? Um, in this case there, the debt service and position was comfortable and the lender approved the loan at 80% of the purchase price over a 20 year term. So just on that um, third point on the left hand side, um, for a purchase price of a million dollars plus the government costs, um, the total cost of 1.055 million, a loan at 80% provides a, a loan at 800,000, meaning that the SMSF contributed 255,000 to the purchase which means they also had you know, a, a fair amount of liquid funds available um, after the purchase of the property. Just to cover us on some of the fees that would typically apply. Um, so there's a, the variable interest rate for the commercial property in this example was around the 5.2% mark. There's a lender application fee, which was 795, an establishment fee, which is 1% of the loan amounts, plus a valuation fee, um, plus the, the lender review of the SMSF and documentation fees of 1,945. Um, so that's essentially an example of the sorts of fees and charges you would expect for a commercial property purchase within an SMSF. Now, as part of the process, a new Bear property trust was established to acquire the property on behalf of the SMSF. Um, and that goes back to George's previous slide on the structure of this sort of borrowing arrangement. Um, the lender takes a mortgage over the property that's been acquired. It takes a guarantee from the Bear Trust and it takes a guarantee from the members of the SMSF. So that's the lender's security structure. And under that arrangement, the lender has no recourse to the other assets of the SMSF, only to the Bear Trust and the property and the individual members. Um, it's also important to note that these are set and forget loan structure with no reviews. Um, if you maintain a variable rate, you have the ability to make additional repayments to the loan to reduce it faster. Um, but it's also important to note there's no redraw features. So once, once you've paid down a loan, you cannot redraw that loan back up to another level. So that's all from, um, for the example for purchasing within an SMSF. So I'll hand back to you, Jamie. Thanks, Alex. Very informative. Um, yeah, very good understanding there around what's required, obviously, to service any debt within a self-managed super fund. Um, so obviously, the rental income, uh, the SMSF contributions and any income that's been made from assets held in that, uh, in that fund can service um, the debt that, that you're looking to ascertain within, uh, within the self-managed super fund. So very informative. And thanks for that, Alex. Really appreciate it.
Um, I'll now pass you on to uh, Lauren Smythe, who is our subject matter expert on all things property, um, property law. So I'll pass you on to Lauren. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Jamie. Thanks, Alex, for that. Um, so today I'm broadly covering um, the key things to look for. Sorry, I'm just getting my slides to work. Um, yeah, so the key things to look for from a legal perspective um, when purchasing a property. So that includes at the due diligence um, pre-contract stage uh, to make sure that your contra contractual obligations uh, align with your strategy and plans. Um, and as well as how to best manage um, the process from um, contract signing stage right up and um, right up until uh, settlement. Uh, so it's really important important to have the contract of sale and vendor statement um, reviewed before signing. Um, so speak to your advisors about your plans um, and ask them to check uh, the terms of the contract in section 32 um, and give you advice on any unusual terms, conditions and matters that might affect the property. Um, if you are purchasing a vacant commercial property and the contract states um, that the purchase price is excluding GST, um, an additional 10% um, will be payable on top of the purchase price. So this also means that stamp duty is payable on that GST uh, adjusted purchase price amount. Um, if you're purchasing a, pro a commercial property that is actually tenanted, uh, then the sale may be regarded as the supply um, of a going concern, um, being a GST free transaction, uh, but the purchasing entity must be registered for GST. So if it is, if it does constitute the supply of a going concern, um, it, uh, it needs to satisfy a couple of things. So firstly, all things will be needed for the continued operation of the enterprise um, are supplied uh, and the supplier needs to carry on the enterprise uh, until the day of the supply. Um, so in other words, um, the activity um, of a commercial property owner uh, leasing that property um, and that lease remaining in place um, until at least um, the settlement date will in most circumstances um, be the supply of a going concern and the sale will be GST free. Um, and it might also be acceptable if the property is made available for lease. So in other words, perhaps it is vacant, but was previously tenanted, um, but is being actively um, marketed and the landlord is looking for a new tenant. Um, there's, it, it's a pretty complex area of law, um, so definitely worth getting advice um, during that pre-contract stage. Um, the section 32 um, will include detailed and really critical information relating to the property and land. So check the title. Um, there might be covenants or easements which affect the property, which might prevent the way you intend to use it. Um, also check for any planning um, overlays and zoning. Um, there might be restrictions or planning requirements or permits required for use um, or development. Um, and there might also um, be notices affecting the property, um, and this could include permits for developments of neighbouring sites. Um, it's also worth checking um, if the property is affected by an owner's corporation, as there are usually um, most often um, fees associated with that, um, and also whether the property is actually being sold um, subject to a lease. So if you are purchasing um, a commercial property that is occupied um, by a tenant under a lease, um, understanding the terms of the lease, um, including whether it's retail or not, um, should be a critical part of that due diligence process. So get the lease reviewed, um, and that's important for a couple of reasons. Um, as the purchasing entity will effectively be stepping into the shoes um, of the landlord um, post-settlement, you need a really good understanding of the terms of the lease that will be in place between you and the tenant. You also want to check um, that the contract of sale has proper regard for the lease arrangement. And by that, I mean checking what rights the landlord or tenant has under the lease um, and making sure that the purchaser um, is properly protected um, under the contract. In terms of what to look for um, when reviewing the lease, the key things to consider are whether it is a retail lease um, and covered by the relevant legislation 
in the state or territory uh, where the property is located. So in Australia, um, each state and territory has different laws and regulations um, regarding uh, lease arrangements. Um, you also want to understand what the length of the term is and whether the tenant has any options to, re um, to renew the lease. Um, the rent amount um, and the rent review method and frequency of those reviews is really critical. Um, look out for face rents, um, which are essentially uh, rent reviews with private tenant incentives um, outside the terms of the lease. Uh, these were introduced back in the 90s um, when there was a massive surplus um, of office space and landlords were really keen to keep up um, the rent um, on the face of the lease to maintain values. Um, and we are starting to see um, similar provisions creeping uh, back into leases um, post COVID. Um, whether the tenant pays outgoings in addition to the rent um, is also something to look out for. Um, it might be a gross rent, which is all inclusive, or you might have your base rent um, and then all other outgoings and utilities are paid outside of that. Uh, the ownership of fixtures and fittings and other assets in the property under the terms of the lease is really critical. So you need a good understanding of who owns them. Um, and in particular, whether there's any overlap um, with the tenant's fixtures described in the lease and the goods that are actually being sold by the vendor under the contract. Um, the condition of the premises. Um, sometimes leases include a condition report um, or refer to one. So if you can get your hands on that, that um, uh, would be ideal. Um, and also checking the repair and maintenance obligations um, under the terms of the lease um, and at law. If it is a retail lease, um, landlords can't typically pass on capital costs and repairs um, to their tenants. Uh, so good to know what you're signing up for. Uh, also, um, most leases have provisions which require tenants to provide some kind of security. So that's often in the form of a bank guarantee, um, cash security deposit, um, or even personal guarantees. Um, and also need to bear in mind how they'll be de dealt with at settlement. Um, so if the tenant has provided a bank guarantee, they'll need to return um, the bank guarantee they provided to the vendor, to that vendor, um, and then provide a replacement bank guarantee uh, to the purchasing entity at settlement. Um, also ideal to check the tenant's insurance obligations um, and ensuring that the tenant has the appropriate insurance in place, particularly um, during that settlement period. Um, and also um, the special conditions in the lease um, that may have been tailored uh, for the current landlord um, vendor and the tenant. Um, and these might include uh, rent free periods, um, landlord um, fit out contributions or incentives. Um, and sometimes there are also first right of refusal clauses um, which allow the tenant um, the first rights uh, to purchase the property. Um, and don't also uh, forget any arrangements that might have been put in place in the last 12 months that relate to COVID um, rent relief. Uh, so that might be um, deferred rent, uh, pauses on rent increases um, and incentives. And then um, just having an understanding of how those might affect uh, you as landlord uh, post settlement. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, um, it's important that the contract of sale does have regard for the lease um, arrangement uh, and properly deals with the, what parties can and can't do during the settlement period. Um, most leases entitle a landlord to uh, consent to an assignment of the tenant's lease, uh, terminate the lease if there's a breach, uh, accept a surrender, uh, call on the tenant's um, bank guarantee if there's a breach, carry out a rent review, um, vary any terms of the lease. Um, and if the landlord has these rights, those rights will continue um, for as long as it is the landlord um, under the lease up until settlement. So in those circumstances, ideally the purchaser um, is kept informed of these types of tenancy management issues, um, or preferably the contract will include a clause um, which requires the vendor to get the purchaser's prior consent before doing any of those things, 
Um, and it should also include um, the appropriate indemnities um, if the vendor does any of these things um, and the purchase suffers a loss. So if you are able to get a lawyer uh, to review the contract before it's signed, these types of clauses can be negotiated um, and can be um, sufficiently dealt with um, with proper drafting. Uh, so preparing for settlement, um, and this is typically something that your conveyance or a lawyer will attend to, um, but it's, also, it's, it's important that you're across the issues as well. Um, so if the property is worth um, more than 750,000, um, the vendor will need to provide a clearance certificate to the purchaser prior to settlement um, if the vendor is a foreign resident. And if they fail to do so, um, the purchaser will have to withhold 12.5% of the purchase price uh, and pay this amount directly to the ATO at settlement. Um, so your advisor should check um, at pre-contract pre stage uh, that the contract um, sufficiently um, covers this. So parties usually agree to um, a clause that extends the settlement date for a specific period. Um, if the vendor can't get a clearance certificate in time, um, and it should also allow um, for that withheld amount to be automatically deducted um, from the vendor's entitlement um, to the balance of the sale proceeds um, at settlement. Um, in terms of adjustments, um, again, it's important to understand um, how the rent, outgoings and other lease related charges um, will be adjusted at settlement. Um, so if outgoings are payable um, by the tenant in addition to the rent, um, you need an understanding of how outgoings are treated um, under the terms of the lease. So if the tenant pays direct to the authorities or does the landlord pay and recover the amounts from the tenant and how that is structured um, will dictate how these charges um, should be adjusted between the parties at settlement. Uh, in Victoria, um, if the lease is a non-retail lease, the landlord can recover its land tax payments from the tenant. Um, so whether the landlord is entitled to do so should be covered under the terms of the lease, um, or if not, um, you should seek uh, legal advice on that particular issue. Uh, in addition to understanding um, if and how land tax will be treated at settlement, um, it will be critical um, to know whether you can recover land tax from the tenant post-settlement. Um, if the vendor pays land tax, um, make sure the land tax liability is paid by the vendor as a condition of settlement. Um, and be careful that the purchasing entity um, is not inheriting the vendor's land tax liability um, after settlement. Um, a tournament notices also need to be provided uh, to the tenant. Um, so this is um, a notice which is usually prepared by the purchaser but given by the vendor uh, to the tenant, which basically um, tells them about the sale, um, advises them of the new landlord, um, and also in includes um, directions of payment of rent um, after settlement. Um, original lease documents um, and all other sort of original documents um, should be collected by the purchaser at settlement. Um, I would only accept copies of lease documents if um, the vendor's lawyer confirms that um, originals are unavailable and you just want to be sure um, that you've got copies of the original documents with no changes having been made. Um, and finally, um, dates, just make sure you've got an understanding and make a record of important dates um, if the property is subject to a lease. Um, you want to be across um, the rent payment um, due dates, uh, rent review dates, and also the dates that the tenant must exercise their option um, if they've got the option to renew for a further term. Um, if it is a retail lease, um, the landlord does have an obligation uh, to notify the tenant um, of these dates in advance. So that's it from me, Jamie. I'll hand back to you. Thanks, Lauren. Some really handy tips there. Um, obviously, first and foremost, definitely look to get the contract reviewed uh, when purchasing in your self-managed super fund. Um, and then secondly, just make sure that you're aware of the, uh, the GST implications and stamp duty implications on any purchase in your self-managed super fund as well. So thanks for that, Lauren. Um, very informative. I'll now pass you on to um, Lee Fernando, who is the director of our private wealth division, um, just to step through um, some, of the, uh, some of his slides there. Thanks, Lee. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks, Lauren. Hi, guys. Um, yeah, my name's Lee Fernando, 
director of the private wealth business, been at Blue Rock for many years now. And, and, and really, I'm, I'm quite passionate about helping people grow their wealth, both inside and outside super, and give, give advice to people based on their personal situation. So initially, when we talked about having this webinar, I was a little bit hesitant, because we have, we have many conversations with current clients, future clients around the appropriateness of a self-managed super fund. And it's it quite, the, the outcomes are quite mixed. So it, it can be appropriate for people, but not, not appropriate for everyone. So I thought I'd give a few examples later on around some situations that are appropriate where it makes lots of sense and another one where it isn't appropriate. But really the theme of my talk today as a financial planner is to talk about people's, people's personal situation and how that relates to buying property within the fund. So I must say when, when it is appropriate, based on people's personal situations, it's one of the best tools that we can use for growing people's wealth um, in a really smart tax effective manner in the short term and the long term. So the ability to borrow money within a self-managed super fund, buy a property, can really help supercharge a client's asset base and retirement strategy. So I'll go through a few key aspects now. Um, Personal traits and investor attributes are a really important thing to, to understand if it's appropriate for a client. So a few key aspects that I'd like to talk through from a personal point of view might be that people have a mortgage outside super that, that isn't too large. They have strong cash flow. So that might, that might mean they're successful in their career. They've got a successful business. And really these two key things give people the ability to push more contributions into superannuation. So ideally that would look like putting $25,000 in a year and um, claiming tax deduction on that. If, if it can't be the full $25,000 a year or 50 as a household, it might be if you're an employee, you put more contributions into super above and beyond the standard contributions your employer puts in. And then if you're a business owner, traditionally business owners aren't aren't amazing at putting contributions into super, but you, you need to have a good business and the ability to push money into the fund, um, which can then help pay down the, the super fund loan. So I think a few other key personal attributes would be people feel strongly about property rather than share portfolios. Business owners looking to buy property is, is one of the key strategies, which I'll flesh out in a little bit more detail later on. Um, people that like to be proactive about their finances is quite important. Um, sorry, change the slides there. Yes, pe people that like to be quite proactive around, around their finances, uh, because ultimately, if you start a self-managed super fund and you become the trustee of your superannuation. So whilst, whilst George's team, the self-managed super fund specialists, take do the majority of the work and really simplify things. Ultimately, it is the client who becomes a trustee of their superannuation. So that, that's a really important one to um, take into consideration. Then look, there's a few, there's a few other also negative aspects around, around self-managed super fund and why it may not be appropriate or really around much more consideration, I would say. So, and People, most people know industry super funds and some people know retail funds. For those types of super strategies, they're set and forget. They're really simple and it doesn't have any input needed from the client. So, you know, that's, that needs to be a consideration that if you do start a self managed super fund and you do buy property, it does need, it does need a bit of activity from, from the client in particular. Um, and then also there's, there's a lot of rules out there and they, and they can be quite harsh if, if you don't do the right thing. So the legislation is there. Um, they can be, you know, 45% taxed on accessible income if the fund becomes non-compliant. So it's a, it's a pretty tough area to navigate by yourself. So I think the main thing there is you need good professional support around you to make sure that you're, you know, doing the right thing with your, with your superannuation. So, I'd say from a from a tax perspective, this is probably one of the one of the really exciting things um, around having a self managed super fund. And really, when we think of super, we think of 
SMSFs in Australia, we really think of it as a tax structure. So in, instead of something that you can't set, you can't touch and you can't utilise until you're 60 or 65, really from a tax structure, the ability to buy property within a fund and then in the future potentially pay no capital gains tax when you sell that after the age of 60, based on some certain rules or after the age of 65, from a tax perspective, that, that's really exciting to, to grow wealth with a, with a property that grows over time, sell it in the future, pay no capital gains. So I'd say that's probably one of the best aspects of this of the strategy of property in super. The other one is in accumulation phase, when, you, when you're growing your assets, the, the maximum tax is 15%. So if you think of people's marginal tax rates, much, much better in superannuation um, rather than in your personal name. So working through asset protection is another really key one. Um, thinking about business, business owners and owning a property, it, it can help protect the assets. So if you've got the, you've got the business running out of a certain premises that your self-owned super fund owns, the business goes into liquidation. Creditors can come after the business owner and assets in their name, but because the property is owned within a self-owned super fund, it's a trust asset, it's generally out of reach of creditors. So that can be a large benefit. Um, and then look, everyone's probably heard a few key buzzwords around cash flow, liquidity, diversification, but I would say that's probably one of the most important things to consider when you're thinking about property within a self-managed fund. So I thought I'd go through a few, few key examples of how we think about cash flow, liquidity and diversification. Um, and in an, in an ideal world, you'd have, you'd have a self-managed super fund, you'd have a property with a loan attached, and it's, which is either neutrally geared or positively geared. We don't really like negative gearing in superannuation because the, the tax benefit isn't as strong as in your own name where the tax rates are capped at 15%. So um, you always wanna have a strong cash flow buffer in any strategy, both inside and outside super. And Alex, as Alex was talking about earlier, having, having a buffer there in a working account um, is, is a really important, a really important aspect of property and self-managed super funds. Um, a, diversified, a diversified portfolio, a share portfolio to complement a, a property is, is really good. Unlike property where you can't, you can't sell a bedroom or you can't sell a, a kitchen, with a, with a share portfolio, you can sell down bite-sized chunks to, to meet any expenses that the, the fund needs. So yeah, complementing a share portfolio with a property is, is really important. Um, and then I think from a liquidity point of view, it's always important to think about when people are retired and they're in pension phase, the, the fund needs to pay down a certain amount for the minimum to meet legislation requirements. And generally the minimum that the fund has to pay out isn't enough to meet people's lifestyle needs. So to have a commercial property, a residential property, there's a certain amount of rent that that will pay. Um, you want to have a share portfolio to complement that because you might need to pull more out of the fund to, to meet those pension payments. So that's a really important one. Um, and then I would say the main exemption to diversification would be specifically for business owners. So that would be if there's a if there's a great strategy where a business owner can buy commercial premises that their business can run from the need for diversification isn't as strong in terms of other situations. So that's where you probably, um, you think differently around diversification if there isn't enough in a fund where the, the amount could be lower to go down that path. Now I thought I'd give you a few, a few there's three examples that I'll run through fairly quickly, I'm conscious of time. Jamie's giving me a little push along. Um, in the in the Q and A section, so I'll, I'll move along really quickly. Um, one is where I would deem this situation not appropriate, and I would have this conversation, you know, once a month or so, where, where people might call up, and I just pick these two professions just because they're easy to understand. So a nurse and a teacher in their thirties with a young family, um, generally their their surplus income is is going into paying down a home loan, educating kids, and running their personal life. So they might have a small superannuation balance of a few hundred thousand dollars and, and I would get a call saying, Lee, 
what do you think? We've been, we've been to a barbecue and our friends say that we should start a self-interested to fund buy a property. Um, and I would say in that circumstance, it's not appropriate um, and they, they shouldn't be starting a self-managed super fund. Moving along to the second example, this is one that I, that I love and, it, and I feel is highly appropriate and a great strategy. So you might have some, some, some successful business owners or professionals where they're in their early 50s and we've, they've got about 15, 10 to 15 years of work left. So there's this window of earning, earning income and they have a strong ability to, to save, they've repaid most of their mortgage, and they can push as much money into the superannuation environment as possible, whilst paying off the debt that they take on. So really they, they end up at the age, after the age of 60 or 65, where they can, they can get tax-free status within their fund, um, and they've paid down their mortgage and they've got a, a tax-free a tax free, um, asset that they can sell in the property. So um, that, can work, that can work extremely well um, and it, it is highly appropriate. Then the next one, which, which most people have heard about, which is probably the most exciting strategy I would say you can deploy for people that are business owners, where the business runs from a certain property, that property is owned within the self managed super fund, they might be currently paying rent. Instead of paying rent, they're paying rent into their own self-managed super fund to pay down the loan. Um, they can be their own tenants. Uh, and, and I think that's great from a flexibility point of view. Um, and you want to have combined super of around sort of $500,000 to make that as, as most effective as possible. Um, that said, look, these are, these are some, a bit of guidance here, but we always, give people advice and then sometimes they won't take the advice and they'll go and set up a fund anyway. So there's a few examples there that I thought I'd run through to make it tangible for you. Um, so in summary there, I think, you know, based on your personal situation, it's important to, to get advice. Um, it can be self-managed super and property can be one of the most effective strategies, I would say, um, to, to minimize tax and, and grow your wealth. And then it's important to understand the structures. You know, George is an expert in that area. So there's a few questions around the structures and entities. He'll be, he'll be really good at answering those. Um, and then important to think about property as in holistically, both inside and outside so far to ensure that it, it um, suits your strategy. And then remembering that superannuation is really your nest egg that sets you up is inheritance for the kids. So it's important to you know spend the time, get the strategy right, um, and um, yeah, it can, it can work really well. So over to you there, Jamie. Thanks, Lee. Uh, very important point there. It is um, it is the client's nest egg. It's um, it's what you'll be you know living off when you when you're in retirement. So it is important to get the, important sorry to get that strategy right. So. Um, if you can get some uh, advice and some help in, in getting that right, it's definitely recommended to do that. Um, I think the other uh, prudent point there that you mentioned, Lee, was just around um, having a bit of a diversification as well in your funds. So don't, don't put all your eggs in one basket um, in terms of a property. Maybe it's better to have um, still get a property, but also have some shares and some other investments that are working for you within there as well. Um, so thanks for that, Lee. Uh, very much appreciated and very informative. Um, I'll now um, pass it over to our audience um, for any questions that uh, there may be. There is a couple in the Q&A section, which I will jump into, but if anyone has any questions, please um, please put your hand up and reach out and we can, we can have a bit of a Q&A session for, for a couple of minutes just here at the end of the presentation. In saying that, if there isn't any questions, I will, um, I will ask one from the Q&A section. The silence there. Okay, must have been a, a very good uh, presentation. If we've got no questions, we must have covered all bases. But um, look, there is there is one here in the Q and A box. Um, there's just a, and this one goes to Alex. Um, we've just got one here from Kylie. Um, she just mentioned that her residential property um, is financed, or she's got a residential property, sorry, financed through um, uh, through the self managed super fund. Um, and she just had um, any suggestions on any lenders for a um, for a potential refinance of that. Um, the, the mortgage is relatively um, relatively small at around um, 170. She has 170k, and she has heard that it's a sort of a minimum of 250 for lenders. Is that right, Alex? Is there anything that uh, any advice that you can offer Kylie there? Yeah, 
Yeah, no, we, um, there would be a lender that can do a, a lower loan amount than 250,000. Um, so yeah, we can definitely take that offline with Kylie. Um, primarily we'd like to understand you know, the reasons that Kylie would like to refinance that loan as well. Um, you know, whether it's a, a high interest rate or if there's another reason. So um, yeah, Kylie, if you would like to reach out, um, we, can, we can have a chat and explore some of those other options and sort of run through what your existing loan structure looks like and reasons for potential refinance as well. I think you were saying in your presentation, Alex, as well, that the, the big four have obviously pulled out of self-managed super fund lending now. Um, and when they were doing loans, they were relatively cheap. Is that right? In terms of interest rates and fees and charges. So they have gone up considerably um, since the big four doing it because of the, I suppose, because of the market. There's only about four or five different institutions that now offer self-managed super fund lending. Yeah, so obviously um, it's, it's not really a competitive market. There's only a handful of lenders in that space, like you mentioned, um, mainly second tier and non-bank lenders. So um, yeah, obviously that's the reason that we're not seeing rates as sharp as you would um, outside of the SMSF structure. And yeah, that's correct. Um, so some of the major banks were doing commercial um, loans not too long ago, but yeah, basically now we've seen all of the major banks pull out of the market yeah. Thanks, Alex. Um, there was a question here from Michael just in relation to your slides um, earlier, George. Um, he, he just mentioned the different strategies. Um, can you just briefly just cover off um, roughly what the strategies were that you, you recommended there in your presentation? Just very briefly. Yeah, there was just five or six there. Yeah, just to summarize. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Uh, just to summarise, so with direct ownership, we've, we've got the buying the property in cash. Um, with the in-specie transfer, that's transferring property into your SMSF that you own. Uh, tenants in common, um, whether that's related or unrelated. And then indirect ownership via, was via uh, an unlisted unit trust, and that could be either a related unit trust or an unrelated unit trust. And the last one was the borrowing via limited recourse borrowing arrangement. Yeah, thanks, mate. Um, and Kerry, yes, we will be making these slides uh, absolutely available to all our, our registries. So we'll get that out via email um, upon exiting the webinar today. So you'll all receive an email with the slides and everything um, of the pack uh, in your email box. So yeah, no problems there. Um, I think there's just another question that's just popped up um, just from Chris, uh, from Chris, sorry. Um, to what extent are related party um, arrangements acceptable to the ATO? For example, uh, director of an SMSF trustee investing in a unit trust where the directors of the SMSF trustee are also directors of the unit trust, corporate trustee. George, I think that's a related party question. So I'll fire over to you for that. Yep. So, so generally um, the, the rules with investing in related party investments is that you cannot have control of the investment. So that could be in the form of the actual share ownership or unit ownership. So once you've got more than 50% um, of the shares or units in the trust, then you've got control. So it would be related party. Um, if you hold less than 50%, then it would be okay. However, if you've got the trustee directors um, and there's no other director, and then those trustees are also the ones that are able to appoint and change the trustee, you might have an issue of control. So it's very important that when that arrangement or that structure is looked at, that we have um, our legal team. So Lauren can assist with that structure in terms of how the documents are prepared to have the correct um, controlling um, of, the, of that investment. Beautiful. Hopefully that answers your question, yeah, your question there, Chris. Um, thanks, George, for covering that off. Um, we just might have one more question, yep, uh, from our very own Callan Cameron. Um, beautiful, Cal. Good to, good to see you online. Um, Cal's question is, uh, in the example of the $1 million property purchase uh, with a 255k self-managed super fund and 800k loan, leaving 245k liquidity from 500k total in their SMSF, what's the minimum li liquidity required approximately to get the 800k loan? Over to you, Alex, on that one. That's a, uh, an LRBA question. Yeah, thanks, Jamie. Um, it, it's really case by case and it depends on the asset, the level of funds held, sorry, the level of liquid funds held within the fund um, and the lender as well. So each of the lenders do have their own rules. There's no set rule in that regard. So um, yeah. if you do have an example in mind, Callan, then we can, um, we can talk offline um, and it's best, you know, to have a specific example in place and we can 
um, basically show you the rules across each of the different lenders in relation to those liquidity requirements because there is no sort of set rule that each of them publish for us. Is there lenders out in the marketplace? Sorry, question from me. Um, is there lenders out in the marketplace that actually don't require any liquidity at all? There are, yeah, there are. But I mean, it would be sort of um, to the best interest of the client to you know have a small portion of funds at, at a minimum um, as you know liquid funds available for any unforeseen events. Um, yeah. But there are a couple of funds that don't have an actual liquidity requirement in there as well. Yeah, so an unforeseen event would be the tenant leaving, not being able to re-rent the property. Get yeah, the exactly. Yeah, so you want to make, you want to ensure there are a level of liquid funds to sort of fund that sort of the loan repayments during a period of time if there is a, a vacancy for three or six months. Yeah, yeah, and I'd say from a outside of the banking rules, from a strategy point of view, having at least sort of fifty thousand dollars in a in a working cash account is is a really good aspect of having a property in self managed of the fund based on yeah, tenants not being able to pay and having to pay principal and interest repayments. 50 grand as a minimum is, would be my view on that. Yeah. Damage or repairs required on the property, anything like that. Yeah, it's a very good point. Thanks, Lee. Appreciate that. Um, I think that's all in terms of the uh, questions um, through the Q&A uh, box. Is there anyone got any other questions or anything they would like to bring up just quickly? Um, if not, we might wrap up the, the webinar and uh, thank you very much to our panel of experts today. Um, really appreciate your time. And um, as I said, we'll get, we'll get these slides out um, after exiting the webinar. Cheers guys and have a great day.